Thanks for joining me for another episode of the Your Longevity Blueprint podcast. Today, my guest is Alexis Yu, who goes by Lexi. She's a double board certified nurse practitioner in the areas of family and pediatric medicine. She's been a nurse practitioner since 2011. She has a bachelor's degree in nursing from Purdue University and a master's from IUPUI as a pediatric nurse practitioner. Lexi decided to expand her knowledge and obtain her post master's degree in family medicine. She has a special interest in functional and anti-aging medicine. She's certified through BioT Medical, specializing in bioidentical hormone replacement therapy for both men and women. She is also working to be a certified provider through the Institute for Functional Medicine to better treat her patients while fixing the root cause of their conditions. Lexi also provides aesthetic services such as Botox, fillers, microneedling, PDO threads, and PRP treatments, and she's certified in peptide therapy, and that's what we're going to get to today. She's a member of the Institute for Functional Medicine and the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. Sounds awesome. like me. We yeah. have a lot in common. Yeah, yeah I was like, we're, we're like the exact replica of each other, uh, except in different states, which is, which is good. It's good. That's why uh, I think, you know, this podcast will be awesome. It's encouraging to me because sometimes I feel like the Lone Ranger. I don't know about you. But oh, yeah. Well, really the, it's, like... it's not fair, though. We're in the Midwest. Like if we were right. in Florida, California, California we'd, yeah, yeah, we'd be, you know, like fish to water. It's just we're kind of these odd people out and that people don't really understand what we do. We're, we're pioneers, right? <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Being females, nurse practitioners, moms. Independent like, practice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Well, tell me your story. So how did you get interested in anti-aging and even aesthetic medicine? Tell me yeah. your story. So uh, I, um, I started out in weight loss. I actually used to work for a bariatric doctor. He specialized in something called a lap band procedure. And so yeah. when I worked for him, I, I learned a lot about metabolism, metabolic function, nutrition. I worked really closely with a dietitian. And what I learned is, is that if I could fix thyroid, if I could balance hormones, they may not need surgery. And so obviously working with a surgeon that probably didn't jive so well. So I, uh, I, I fortunately for me, there was a, there was a physician, a DO who, who was looking to bring on a female provider. And I was like, perfect. So, um, so I, I started with him and, and really what was nice is I had a lot of autonomy to kind of educate and, and kind of look to see what all I wanted to do. So I, I really got a special interest and I call it this women, this lost women's population. And I don't know if you have, you have this too. And it's kind of like, you know, women in their, their twenties and their thirties, they're pregnant they're having babies and they're followed by the OBGYN. And then it's kind of like, you got this postmenopausal women who are like, okay, they're done having periods. Well, then there's this like lost population of women who yeah. are put on antidepressants, who are put on fentermine, who are put mm -hmm. on all kinds of pain pills, different things when it's not a Prozac deficiency, it's a thyroid deficiency or it's a testosterone deficiency. And so that's really where I found my, my niche in that you, you get one lady feeling good and she tells her friends and then she tells yep. her friends and then before you know it, you've got a wait list of 120 patients and you're booked out till May. <laughs> so, so you know what I'm saying? And yeah, so yeah. Um, it's kind of one of those things. So I started out uh, through um, the Institute of Integrative uh, Medicine uh, in hormone replacement therapy. So I learned about creams and trochies and injectables, you know, and that's kind of where I started. And then uh, one of my patients, in fact, her mom is a bio provider. And she's like, Lexi, you need to do this. This is like, uh, you know, you got to do this. And so, you know, kind of like, you, I'm like, okay, well, let, let me look into this. And so I did some research and I was like, uh, you know, him and Han hesitant. And so finally, you know, I went to, to um, Texas and I got my bio certification there mm -hmm. and really it like just skyrocketed. So what happened, so how this translates into aesthetics is, you know, I had a lot of women who would come see me and they're like, you know, Lexi, when are you going to learn how to do an injectable? So this way I don't have to go anywhere. Like I, you're going to be a one, one stop, stop shop. shop. Yeah. <laughs> That's what consumers are looking for. Yeah. And so I was like, eh, you know, I don't know. And I, my background as a nurse is I actually used to be a, a general surgery nurse practitioner. So procedures, like I knew how to suture, I knew how to do all kinds of proced hands, procedural stuff. So that yeah, didn't yeah, make yeah. nervous at all. And so I was like, okay. So, uh, fortunately I had a really good friend who was a a nurse practitioner injector and she worked for a plastic surgeon. So I kind of really, she did a great job mentoring me, kind of picked my brain like, okay, this is, you know, this is where you want to go for training. So I highly encourage people to go get trained, get a good certification. Um, and it doesn't stop there. Like I, I think I counted this, this year alone, I think I have attended so far already four trainings in, in mm -hmm. advanced injectables. And I think I got another like four or five the rest of this year. So yeah, it's, yeah. it's what's so cool about sex. It's an, it's like peptides. It's, it's an ever evolving and, and you always want to kind of stay ahead of the curve. And so, um, that I think honestly, that's kind of why women like coming is because they're like, Oh, you know, Lexi will fix it. Like, just, just tell her what's wrong. Tell her what bothers you and she'll fix it. And so, um, so that's kind of how I got started. I mean, I didn't set out 
you know, I know some nurses, like I can tell you my office nurse, Carmen, she's like, I just want to be injector like my whole life. And I'm like, really? I kind of just landed in aesthetics and it just made sense, you know, made sense. And then as I got to do, I really enjoy anatomy. I like looking at the face. I like how the aging process takes place and you know, how structures, if you fix this, it'll actually fix what's below it. Kind of like in functional medicine, we look at downstream. Mm right? Yeah. So it's kind of translates. So that's kind of how I got into aesthetics. And uh, yeah, so my, my practice is it's a pretty busy practice. I have uh, another nurse practitioner who helps me. She's bio T certified. Um, she helps me with, with uh, functional medicine, gut health. Um, and she's getting certified through the um, SAFM, which is the school of, I don't know uh, that applied one. Functional, oh, uh, school okay. of applied functional medicine. And then, uh, I will actually sit for my board this year for IFM. So the Institute for functional medicine, and then, um, I'm bringing on another nurse practitioner. She'll start in June. She was actually a student here and, um, she will probably go through a four M. So my goal was to have us all kind of trained in different schools <laughs> just because it's like good. Cause we can kind of compare notes and, and stay advanced. And then I have a nurse injector who, um, I've sent her to different courses. And then I actually train with, like, I train her in some yeah, of the yeah. advanced stuff cannula technique and things like that. So well, it sounds like awesome. you're, I love it. <laughs> sounds like you're very progressive and you have a successful practice, which is exciting. And you're growing, but you have to stay progressive, right? To stay on the cutting edge. And Absolutely. you want, obviously we want to sure. keep our patients and we want them to know that we're are trying to stay ahead of the game, but it takes such a commitment with, you know, providers like ourselves to go to additional trainings, right? It's a oh, financial absolutely. investment, a time investment, like, but, but we're very committed to that. So today I want to talk about aesthetics. We've had several episodes where we've talked about hormone pellets, and that's something that is near and dear to my heart, something that we we certainly offer here at the clinic. And if you're listening and you want to know more about BioT hormone pellets, I interviewed CEO and founder of BioT, Dr. Gary Donovitz, a few episodes ago. Well, actually, the episode launched, because I don't know when this one will launch, that episode launched in March of 2021. So please check out that episode. Before we get to aesthetics, I want to lay a, a bit of a foundation. I use that foundation word a lot here on the podcast. I feel like I need to say a disclaimer. So I wrote this book, Your Longevity Blueprint, back in 2017. And if you read it, you know it's a very long book. It's like 350 pages. And I wanted to add a chapter on aesthetics. <laughs> and I didn't. I wanted to add a chapter on the curb appeal of the home, right? AKA aesthetics. But I was already fighting with the publisher as far as the length. <laughs> they wanted the book about half as long as it was, and I didn't want to take anything out. So the aesthetics chapter got tabled for the time being, but I hope with a second edition, I can add more in about aesthetics. Quite frankly, I need more experience to even write about it. And so that's why I bring on guests like guests like Lexi. But had I have added that chapter, it would have been the last chapter, right? Because I do feel strongly that to improve the curb appeal of the home, or AKA to improve your appearance right on the skin, we still have to work on the inside of the body, right? So we have to have a strong gastrointestinal foundation, right? We don't want to have a lot of butt inflammation because that will show up on the skin. So acne, psoriasis, I mean, even lines and wrinkles, I think a lot of that has to do with our inner health. And so Although today's podcast is about what we can do externally right? <laughs> uh, with injectables and, and some fun things Lexi's going to share, I don't want to minimize how important it is to still eat clean, right? To still follow all the other steps in the blueprint for longevity. But with that being said, with that disclaimer laid, <laughs> let's get to the topic of today, which is aesthetic. So I want Lexi, if you can, to share the aging process in relation to the appearance of our face. So what happens as we age, right? I know we get wrinkles and like, can you tell us more specifically what happens? Yeah, absolutely. So typically as, as we all age, we lose collagen in our face, right? So collagen is what keeps your face nice and tight. It keeps what, you know, it, it keeps it um, in its place. It keeps the skin plump. It just does a lot. And, you know, going back to, I call it functional dermatology um, in that, if I have a patient with rosacea, I often say, we got to do a gut test on you before I can get my fancy laser and maybe put you on some hydroquinone. We got to do a gut test on you because there could be some candida in there mm -hmm. and we got to fix that. In addition to, we can do all these other fun things. So, so I a hundred percent agree with you on that. So, so as we age, you know, we lose collagen and then postmenopausally we lose estrogen and estrogen is another hormone that is so, so important for uh, improving the texture of the skin. We often see more crepiness when that happens. Um, so kind of going from the top down, the first thing that we start to see when aging is, is, is the, uh, the frontalis muscle. So this is your forehead muscle. So this is, uh, you know, that we call it like the stair steps on the, on the forehead. Um, unfortunately, you know, as, as everyone ages, this is going to appear people who are more expressive are going to notice it a lot more. Um, and so with that one, you know, I, I typically say there's, there's, you know, there's baby Botox. So you can start before it becomes a huge problem. And then when I get women in their fifties and maybe they're for, you know, this is their first time with an in a neurotoxin, they have static lines. And so static lines are etched in lines 
if their face is at rest, they're still there. So those mm. are a little bit harder to, um, to kind of treat. Now I will tell patients, you know what, you, you may notice a significant improvement after the first treatment, but truly after the second, third treatment, it's pretty much gone. So I think definitely setting realistic expectations mm-hmm. with the patient is, is key in this, in the aesthetic industry. So, so the forehead, you know, tends to, uh, tends to start, you know, getting those static lines, um, typically, and especially if, you know, in our situation, when we see a lot of thyroid patients, they're going to start to lose some of the, the, uh, hair on the outer brow. Mm-hmm. Um, and so then we start to notice more of the, um, the, uh, like the temporal, like the temporal suture. So that is kind of where your temples are starting to look more hollow, just because again, everything's kind of uh, losing collagen in the mid face. You're going to start to see, we call this the, um, the, the maxillary fat pad. So if we think about our, our cheekbone, kind of like a upside, like an upside down triangle, right? So, and, and really kind of the whole face, when we think a youthful face, we think, you know, the tip of the triangle is at the chin and it, and it is straight and it's down, right? When we think an aged face, the triangle is where the tip is at the forehead and it comes down. So you start to see things like jowling or the pre-jowl sulcus, which is kind of where the marionette lines start to fall. So those so are like times, coming out of your mouth. If you're listening, right? Is right. Am I right? So yeah, like the, the, literally. Yeah, the corner of the mouth. Uh-huh. Yeah. It looks like a marionette, right? And so all of that is typically caused by a loss or a deterioration or shrinkage of the, um, the maxillary fat pad. So in the mid face. Unfortunately, again, when that shrinks, it's also going to start pulling down your period, like the, the orbital, the orbital area, which is where your tear trough is. And so sometimes you're going to see more hollowing in that. Um, And then kind of in the lower face, you know, we call them smoker lines or perioral lines. Um, And so you can get that from whistling, you get it from drinking from a straw. I mean, you can get it from a lot of different things, but um, that's another really prominent sign of aging is when you get the little vertical lip lines or barcode lines. Um, So that's, that's common. Also, there is another um, muscle um, in the lower face called the DAO, which, which is the depressor angulite oris muscle. And a lot of times over time, this is very prominent. And what it does is it pulls the corners of your mouth down. So you always look like you're frowning. Um, so that can be, you know, that can be something we can also fix with neurotoxins. And then lastly, you know, looking at the chin, unfortunately, as women get older, we lose bone mineralization, right? Mm-hmm. So the bone starts to shrink and then it starts to recede. So then you kind of go from this nice, beautiful snatched chiseled jawline in your youth to now like this, like little round, sad, saggy face. And so, um, when I do a consult with a patient, I sit up in the chair and I have my iPad out, which I have a really neat, like anatomy face. And I turn it and I kind of go over the muscles. It's almost like a, it's like an anatomy lesson when, when they do it. And I, and I ask, you know, they're like, okay, sitting in the chair and I, and they're like, well, what do you think? And I, and I say, well, what bothers you? Cause what I see may not be what you see. Right. So I think it's definitely one see what is bothering the patient. Cause it may just be like their crow's feet. And you're just like, oh, okay, well then forget what I said about your mouth, you know? And so, um, so that's kind of, you know, when we talk about the aging process, the two biggest things is loss of collagen and the loss of, um, the fat pads. We lose the, the plumpness sure. in our face. Sure. So from a treatment perspective, I guess I'll start yeah. with neurotoxins, right? Yeah. Okay. Which so, can be controversial so to the listeners. So I want to know if you're comfortable oh, absolutely. with neurotoxins in all patients or in certain yeah. patients with like autoimmune conditions, are you more cautious with them? Exactly. Or, give me, yeah, give me a question. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I get, I, I don't want to say I get flack, but I've gotten some really, some really nasty DMs from people like, how can you say, you know, you focus on root cause and, and then, you know, I, I, and what I, I don't try to peg myself as anything. I would say I am more like an anti-aging, like longevity provider. Mm-hmm. And who am I to say, don't get toxins because, you know, because it's bad, you know, okay. So I, I just leave it up to the patient. And if they want to do it, I'm here to provide them with all the information and the comfort. Sure. Now there is an actual neurotoxin on the market that is supposed to be preservative free. Um, and so I'm actually, I just talked to the rep this week and I was like, send me what studies you have as far as this product in autoimmune patients. Now I'll be hundred percent honest with you. I have patients who have autoimmunity who do fine with Botox, Dyspor, yeah, sure. uh, you know, those products who do completely fine. Um, you know, especially with Hashimoto's, I feel like so many of my patients have it. So, yeah. So it's kind of like, um, so the first, the first, um, toxin that I'll talk is, is, is about is Botox. Um, and so this is made by a company called Allergan. So Botox is kind of a term, like when we say Kleenex, you really mean tissue, but you say Kleenex because it's just the most well-known, right? Yeah, Yeah. Um, so Botox, um, is a, uh, it's a neurotoxin modulator. So what it does is it, you inject it and it goes in and it, and it paralyzes the muscle. Um, it 
starts to act in about seven days and it will take about a full 14 days to have its full appearance. And so it's not uncommon where we first inject you and you might have like a wonky brow at like day five. So you kind of look like, you know, Ace Ventura where he's got like those weird brows. Mm -hmm. And I always tell patients, it's okay. We we're not going to touch anything up until day 14 duration. It should actually last somewhere between three to four months. Um, some people get longer duration at minimum though, uh, hopefully about three months. Now we have a lot of, um, patients in our practice who, uh, we're, we're right next door to CrossFit gym. So we have tons of very, very fit metabolically high patients. And so, man, they just like their pellets, they just burn through them so quick. Mm -hmm. So some of those patients, I have to kind of give them a little bit more than where I would, you know, and then the question we always get is, well, how many units am I going to need? So Botox is dosed by units. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, um, a good kind of rule of thumb is I'll say for every age year of age of life is how many units you may need. So for me, I'm 36. So 36 is a pretty solid dose for me. Um, so, so again, the range can kind of just depend on, you know, what is the, uh, the achieved look? Do you want it completely smooth? Some women come in and they'll say, I want it. I want it. Like I like my margaritas frozen. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Some women will say, I want it more natural. And that's fine too. Um, so that's one product. Um, another product that I really, really, I probably use this product the most is called Dysport. Mm -hmm. um, Dysport, I like it because the molecule is a little bit smaller. So the onset is much quicker. So if you have an event in like a week, this would be a great product to get because the onset is about day three, day five. Um, there's different ways that you can mix it up. And the reason I actually like this product is because the spread is a little bit bitter, not bigger. And what I mean by that is, is that you can make one poke and it in the circumference, imagine the area around it will actually capture more wrinkles versus Botox is kind of more of a precise um, injection. So, you know, it takes <laughs> obviously some practice and training and familiarity with the product, but I really, really like this port for that reason is the onset is much qu quicker. I also find that women notice that they don't get an overly stiff or an overly frozen look. And so, mm -hmm. you know, women in their thirties, they, they kind of want to just look refreshed. They don't want to look like they've had a lot of stuff done. They just kind of want to yeah. look like them, but just rested. Um, and so I really like this port for that reason. So with that one onset is three day, three to five days compared to Botox is seven to 10 duration is exactly the same. Um, I actually, you know, I like you love to kind of do my own experiments. And so I actually did a split face study on a patient. She was like in her sixties because most of my patients, when they would come to me, they were Botox all day, every day. And I'm like, I feel like you're, you're missing out here on this really awesome product. So I had a patient, she was in her sixties and I took a ruler and I literally just drew it down her face and I landmarked her face, like on a, on a diagram. And I said, okay, this, these are where the injections go. So I injected the exact same dose and the exact same location as I did on the left and the right side. And what's so crazy is that the disport side, the onset was obviously much quicker. quicker yeah. The spread was much nicer. And what I mean by that, she didn't have, we call it Spock brow. So it's like where the tail of the brow starts to, cause you didn't, you didn't, you didn't hit that area. You didn't hit that, um, that frontalis muscle over there. And so, um, so it actually showed on this experiment to be far superior than Botox, which is crazy. Cause all we know is Botox, right? Well, then um, she had to wait three months for the boat for them to wear up. And then she, she yeah, she was a little lopsided. <laughs> yeah, she was a little lopsided for a hot second, but she, I mean, she was so most of my patients are like, you could try whatever you want on me. Just like, let's go. Um, my patients are very willing to let me do some cool stuff to them. So, so I thought that was so interesting. And, um, so, so that's a secondary product. Those are the two products I mainly carry in my office, mainly because I feel like sometimes when you offer too many options, patients have yeah. no idea what you're talking yeah. about. So yep. those are the two main ones I use. Um, there is another product called Zeomin. Yeah, um, yeah. Zeomin, what's neat about this product is it's it's um, preservative free. Yep. And so this is the product that I have um, some research out for to see if this would be a preference for patients with autoimmunity. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, is because it is pre preservative free, they, they say that um, you are less likely to build an antibody to this product. Yeah. Um, to this toxin. So what I mean by that is, is, you know, if you get Botox every three months for five years, it may start requiring more product mm -hmm. to get the same effect. So I actually like to kind of change it up for my patients. So sometimes I go every other, sometimes say, okay, you're due for Botox. We're going to do Dysport the next time. So this way it kind of creates this, you yeah. know, this neurotoxin confusion. So Zeomin is another really good product. Um, and then there's another one that um, I, I don't use just because again, I try not to confuse my patients, but it's called Juvo. And Juvo is the newest neurotoxin on the market. Um, from my understanding and talking to some of the other injectors, I just... 
I hear it's, I hear it, you know, the onset is good. I just don't hear that you get the longevity that you sure. get out of Botox and Dysport. So again, just to try to make it easy for my patients to just pick one Botox and Dysport is, is typically what I, what I use. So, um, this may so be a silly, silly question, but as I'm looking at myself in the camera here also, so you talked about the face and kind of the changes that can happen, right? And I'm already seeing certain lines on my face. What about the neck? Can you even get like Botox yeah. in your neck? Oh, absolutely. Like, okay. absolutely. Yep. So, um, so the areas that you can get Botox and, you know, there's, and I'm going to talk off label just because, you know, I'm not affiliated with anybody. So mm -hmm. I'll, I'll kind of start from top down. So frontalis muscle is a very common area. A lot of times I like to get the tail of the brow and it'll give you a really nice arch in your brow, kind of give you a little mm -hmm. brow lift, which tends to help a lot with think about patients who've lost that collagen and they got ptosis or lid lag. Mm -hmm. So like two or three little units in the tail of the brow can really go a long way. So right. that's, you know, the frontalis muscle. Then we treat the glabella. So the glabella is the 11s or the frown lines, you know, yeah. and that is um, in the glabella is the procerus muscle, which is the muscle right between the eyebrows. And then you've got two muscles called corrugators. And the way I describe it, it's kind of like a tug of war, like one's going this way and the other one's going this way. And so when you're treating the 11s, it's really important that it's a very strong muscle that you really do a good job of assessing where does the muscle start and where does it end? and making sure that you're hitting the belly of the muscle. So the corrugators, just to make sure you got even evenness. Um, so that's, that's probably the most common areas. Another uh, area that you're going to see is the or orbicula orbiculus oculi. So that's like your crow's feet, right? So those are your smile lines. Um, some people I call it, they, they the, the, like the Tyra Banks, the smizing, you smile with your eyes kind of thing. So some people have deeper crow's feet than others. Um, and so that's a really good area to kind of open up your eyes and to, um, to kind of give you a little bit of a brow lift. It works really, it, you just look really rested and you'll notice it a lot when you take pictures like, Oh, well, you know, I don't see those lines anymore. Yeah. It's um, easy to go a little overboard on the crow's feet sometimes. So it's, it's one of those things you have to look to see, are you hollow in the under eye? Cause if you're really hollow, I would not overly relax that area. Cause it'll actually make kind of that top mid face fall. And you don't want to do that. And not unless you're planning on chasing it with some filler. So, um, so, so that's a common area bunny line. So when you, when you squinch your nose, you'll get little bunny lines kind of right in between there. So that's a, that's a common area. I like to get mine, um, done. So the nasalis muscle, um, we do something called, there's something called a gummy smile. So when you, I, I don't, I, I don't have one, but when you smile, let's say your, your top lip disappears and you see mostly your gums, we call it a gummy smile. Oh, sure. So yeah. You can inject like four little units in the labialis muscle and you kind of do it like right in the, like right in the middle, not in the vermilion border, but right in the middle. And what's so cool is it'll actually relax the labialis muscle. So you're, when you smile, it doesn't crawl up in there. It actually stays put. Hmm. So that's an option. We do uh, something called a lip flip. So a lip flip is where we inject about four, four or five units, just depending on the patient into right into the vermilion border. And so what that does is it creates a little bit of an E version or like a little bit of a more protrusion up of, to give you a, like a nice little pout. It does not replace volume. It just changes kind of the positioning of, of the labialis or the, or the vermilion border area. We do something called, um, DAO injection. So if you make kind of like a little weird sour face, you're going to see two little muscles right there. Um, and what this will do is it will, it will relax the depress depressor anguli oris muscle, which will help your mouth not look so frowny. It kind of relaxes it. So you can have a, you know, symmetrical smile instead of downward. Um, and then the mentalis muscle. So the mentalis is, we call it orange peel chin. Like Botox has all kinds of slang words. Orange peel chin is what we call it. So people, again, as we age, that bone demineralizes and it start that chin starts to recede in. So this is a great way to, and, and I usually prefer to do some filler with it, but it's a great way to kind of smooth out that chin to give you a nice little peak. Because again, if we think about what's his anti-aging or what's his youthful look, it's the upside down triangle. So we really want that chin to be nice and pronounced and um, pointed because it will, it will soften up the jaw, the jaw, the jawline. So you don't look like jowly. Sure. Um, so that's kind of, you know, when we go there. So to your question, the neck, so there are two things. So if you make like, if you make like a 
like a, like a pooling face. Yes. Those are called platysmal bands. So we can inject a little bit of neurotoxin in the platysmal bands and that will definitely relax it. Um, we also have something called, and I don't even know what these lines are called. We call them technic. So technic, if you think about when you're texting on your phone and you're looking down, we call those technic. I have a lot of them just because I'm on my phone a lot. Um, and so we can do a couple things with that. We can do some, there's a product called, um, radius, which is a biostimulator. So, uh, Carmen and I will do something called hyper dilution radius. And so we dilute it a little bit down with bacterial normal state, um, saline, and we, um, we come subcutaneous. So just bare, or like almost like intradermal even. And what that does is it stimulates your own collagen and your own growth factor, which is great. So that one will build over time. You can do a little bit of Botox in there. Uh, I typically over dilute it a little bit because I don't want it to overly relax. It's just kind of enough to improve the skin texture. Um, the biggest one that I do a lot with is threads, PDO threads. And we'll talk a little bit about what that is, but that's yeah, another yeah. option. So yeah. kind of one depends on like, what's our acquired look? How much movement do you have? What's your budget? You yeah. know, how quick do you need to be looking good? Like, do we got, do we have like a, a thing next week? Or is this like just in long-term, you know, processes? So, so those kind of cover neurotoxins, other good. areas we, we can do it in the master muscles and that'll actually slim down the face. And it also helps with migraines, like jaw clenching migraines. Hmm. And, uh, we can also do it in the axis for um hyperhidrosis so excessive sweating so uh, that for hyper i have like 10 questions based on everything you just said for hyperhidrosis so botox is also still going to just last three to four months right so those patients would that have to return every three to four months is that right well, for- so because the dose is actually a lot bigger i actually find that six months is what they awesome. can get out yeah. of it six months and if a patient has excessive sweating, then they're probably pretty toxic. <laughs> Potentially, there's some other functional medicine things we can work on to help minimize the oh, sweating absolutely. as well. Yeah. So I want to make sure the listeners are hearing what you're saying. So when you said, you know, based on your age, you may need the equivalency in units, that's for a full face then. That's right? for so full face. So if you're yeah, 37 years old and you need, yeah, so that would be to get the whole full face done. Okay. Um, I want to go back to the, the comment you said, because I had a patient tell me this once that her mother told her to never drink out of a straw or she was going to get lines on her face. Are you saying, which lines did you say you get from drinking out of a so straw? So there's, there's like the vertical lip lines. So those are like yeah. your smoker's lines. So they're the lines above oh, right the million. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So okay. like if you whistle, whistle, and you'll see those little etched in lines. Those are yeah. smoker's lines or uh, vertical lip lines. Sure. Okay. Interesting. So now, now let's go on to PDO threads, which I do not know a lot about, although maybe by the time this podcast launches, I'll be doing them in the clinic. Yeah, (laughs) they sound pretty exciting. So tell me, so are these an alternative to fillers? Is this just a different? Yeah. So, so let me explain the difference. So filler replaces volume. So we, you know, like I said, with aging, we have loss of volume in the mid face. So typically I love the whole, there's a Dysport, um, the company who makes Dysport is called Galderma and they have a huge portfolio of different fillers. So every place in your face has a filler for that exact reason. For example, and I'll, I'll make it quick because I know you want to get into threads. Um, so in the mid face, there's a product called wrestle and lift L Y F T. It is, it has a high G prime, meaning it holds heavy stuff up. So when I do some cheeks, I, uh, love to do wrestle and lift. I say, it's literally like a push up bra to your face in that it just, it does. Now it doesn't necessarily lift. It gives you the illusion of lifting, but what it does is it replaces the volume oh, yeah. loss in sure. that maxillary fat pad. Um, so I love that you want to, you want to fill in the tear troughs. If, if you've noticed some hollowing, cause if you just feel fill in cheeks and you've got these hollow eyes, you're going to look sunken in even more. So there's a product called wrestling classic, or even wrestling silk is a good product in there. Um, and then in the peri, the peri oral lines, lip lines, you can do some wrestling silk in there, the lips. Oh, there's a beautiful product called wrestling kiss. And it's the only product on the market that has a one-year duration with no touch-ups required. Um, and these are all reversible fillers. These are what we call HA or hyaluronic acid fillers. So if, if some event should happen and, uh, perhaps you got a vascular occlusion, these are all reversible. So we have a protocol. So should that happen? Um, and basically what that means is that filler has occluded in some sort of, um, some sort of artery. And so we have to reverse it. So we have to inject something called hyaluronidase or Hylanex into that. And that's, and that is why when I talk about training and, and fillers and continue, because I don't want 
you know, new NPs or nurses who think I'm just going to go to this class and I'm an injector. Absolutely not. No, no, no. That's not how it works. You have to know what are, what are the risks? And like, you know how as a nurse, I don't know if you ever had, so we're on the unit and you would do like mock code blue. We actually do like mock vascular occlusion because I want all my staff to know what is your role in this situation? Cause time yeah. is of the essence. Where's everything located? You know, where's this at? How do I mix it? Um, because it's, it's important. It's a safety issue. We want to keep our patients safe. So, so, so PDO threads help with stimulating collagen and they help with traction or lifting. Filler replaces volume. So it's a little different. So sure. in a lot of our patients, again, thinking about going back to what kind of practices we have, we have a lot of hormone patients, right? So again, you know, they've lost a lot of estrogen and a lot of collagen in their face. So the cool thing is, is that I find that if I work on maybe a little bit of PDO threads, it will actually help do most of the work. So PDO, PDO stands for polydiaxinone. What it is, is it's a dissolvable stitch. And so we, um, they, there's different kinds. There's smooth threads, which are more of your collagen producing threads. Um, and these are all dissolvable. There are twists threads, which are kind of like act kind of like a smooth, but kind of like filler in that they tend to replace a little bit of volume with it. And then you have barb threads. Barb threads are kind of like, imagine like the stem of a rose and how um, you've got this stick, but then you've got these little thorns on the side of it. And so as you remove the, the little straw or the cannula that comes in, as it, as you pull it out, those thorns activate and it lifts as it pulls up. So it holds structures up. So those actually lift. Um, versus saying wrestle and lift lifts. It really doesn't. It replaces volume, but it gives you the illusion of a lift. Um, so with that, uh, uh, those threads typically last somewhere between 18 months to two years. Um, I would say probably 18 months. Um, the onset is, is pretty quick as far as you're going to notice an improvement like that day. The best part about it is, is it's also a biostimulator. So it does stimulate collagen over time. The threads that uh, are in there should dissolve by about four, four or five months. But what's left is you've built up all this really beautiful collagen around it. And so as you've lifted it, it should stay in place. So, um, so it works extremely well. It is a completely awake procedure. We don't give any sedation for it. It is an in-office procedure. We call it a non-surgical facelift is basically what we're doing. Um, we do, we do a fair amount with like lidocaine. I do like, like a, like a local block and I'll lay some different tracks of threads. So as far as, you know, what product and where do I pick, it just depends. You know, if, if, if patients have strong nasal labial folds, which are like the parentheses lines or the smile lines around the mouth, I will use my barb threads or my lifting threads. And I will um, start them um, kind of by the zygoma is the insertion point. So I numb that area. I put a little, I like make a little insertion hole. So I use about an 18 gauge, you know, they should be numb. They, if I've done my job, they should feel nothing. And then I make the little hole. I slide these little threads. So the threads are not activated when you slide them in, you're sliding kind of somewhere between the, the intradermal layer and, and a layer called the SAMAS, um, which stands for like subcutaneous, uh, I forget what the That's rest okay. of it stands for. But anyway, <laughs> as, it, as it's going in there, it, hold, it you, you put it in, you activate it, you twist it and you pull it out. And as you pull it out, all these little thorns come out and it holds it up. So it works extremely, extremely well. Um, what I personally like about it is I, I say kind of like threads are like the go green of aesthetics because they're like, there's no toxin involved. Right. There's no risk of vascular occlusion. There's no, um, you know, there's no real, I don't want to say risk. I mean, cause there's, there's risk with everything, but there's no real adverse event that like really can't be fixable. Um, you know, the worst that you can have is you bruise. Or if you're not in the right plane, and that's the hardest thing is finding the right depth to which you need to be at, you might have some dimpling if you're not in the right place. But honestly, those are the two worst things that can happen compared to some of the other stuff that we do. I'm like, we'll take that all day, every day. So I, I do like the threads in that I, um, it gives us the collagen that we're looking for. It's not a toxin. Um, the risk of vascular occlusion is not there. Patients love them. We've, so we, we, Carmen and I, we trained in like December. And since that time, we've done it probably- 70 or 80 cases of threads in that time. Mm -hmm. And my practice, we're not a med spa. We're not an aesthetics only practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I have to actually block time in my schedule to do aesthetics only. Cause if I didn't, I'd be doing pellets all day, all right, every day, yeah. you know, <laughs> kind of thing. So, um, 
So I do strictly aesthetics every other Friday and there's some sprinkled throughout the week, but it's, it's allocated to that day. Cause then I'm in like thread mode or I'm in filler yeah, mode, you know, yeah, it's like yeah. a brain thing, but, uh, yeah. but yeah, we do a ton. We do a ton. The coolest thing is, is that and one of my patients put it best. She's like, you're probably a surgeon's worst nightmare. And I was like, why do you say that? And she's like, because we don't, you don't have, there's no downtime. You can, I mean, you just don't want to, you know, get, uh, you don't want to work out for about five to seven days, but there's no downtime. You walk out of here. Like you've had nothing done to you. Um, you know, and, and it's not price wise, it's not horrible. It's not the cost of a facelift. Right. So I think, I mean, it's like win, win. So it's cool. I, I love doing threads. So am I hearing you right? So basically you're numbing up the face. You're doing some sort of nerve block, whatnot. You're, you're, mm -hmm. you're essentially placing, I don't know the depth of these. If you guys want to watch her, she, she on her Instagram, what's your Instagram thread, Lexi? Yeah, it's, um, it's at you direct health underscore aesthetics. And there's, there's tons of videos of me putting in threads yeah. and numbing threads and pulling threads. Yeah. There's so tons. even uh, for those of you, even listening today, if you want to understand more of what she's saying, watch the video on YouTube because if she, you know, if she's been pointing to the, the facial muscles and whatnot through this whole interview, which I know can be difficult to, to take in and absorb when you're listening, but if you want to see her place PDO threads, check out her Instagram site. So essentially you're literally just placing this thread, you're saying you're activating it and then you're actually pulling it out and it's going to stimulate collagen production for the next like year and a half. Is that what you're saying? Like yes. So what, what, what you're, what you're placing, there is a very tiny, um, it's like a metal wire. Okay. So the metal wire has the thread in it. So imagine like a cannula. That's oh, what it sure. is. It's kind of so like a cannula. The so thread, you're taking thread out the wire. inside. Exactly. Okay. It's kind of like, yeah, it's kind of like you're weaving it in there. We call those vectors. So vectors are basically one thread to, you know, so if I say I placed four vectors on each side, that meant I placed four barb threads for lifting on each side. So we call them vectors, but yeah, so sure. it is a very thin metal cannula that helps me glide into the, into the depth that I need to do it. Once I'm in the right spot, I feel it. And it's like a pop. Um, you twist it as you twist it, it activates the thread. Mm -hmm. And so you're able to slide or glide the metal piece out. That's and basically they're going to see, I mean, they're going to see results over time as the collagen mm -hmm. is, you know, production stimulating, but are they going to look different like immediately? So or they'll, they'll be, because if you think about it, it's creating, it's creating a little bit of traction or a lift. Yeah. So you're going to yeah. notice it fairly right quick, away. Yeah. but the maximal um, results to see it will be about eight weeks, about okay. two months later, I usually bring them back and I, and we take pictures and, but like you said, there's no downtime, like literally there's no, no, major no. I mean, like, yeah. uh, you know, it's, it's hard to take a week off of working out sometimes just because that's my, that's my Prozac there. But, um, but aside from that, no, I mean, sleep feels a little weird. Like the best recommendation I give to patients is get like an airplane pillow because where, where those insertions were, they're a little tender, you know, they're a little tender. And so, um, I have people try to like lay on your back or like a neck pillow is helpful. Um, I have patients make sure that they don't do any dental work for at least two weeks after, because you yeah. don't want to overextend your mouth. Yep. Yep. Um, I actually got some threads and I forgot about it. I went to go bite into an apple and I was like, Ooh, it doesn't hurt. It just kind of pulls. Like it feels like your mouth is a little restricted to kind of op open it up a little bit. Um, but it's, it, it's not, it's not bad. It's not bad. And um, so two, two weeks. Oh, sorry. What's finish. That? I'll just, I'll let you finish. <laughs> Oh, I just said, so really two weeks of no dental work. And then one week of no working out is really kind of the only down the biggest downtime. Per sure. So can patients combine fillers with threads? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And those are like the best rejuvenations. We're actually talking yeah. about our April specials. And I think that's what we're going to do. The coolest thing is when you, when you do threads, they don't need as much filler because you're, you're helping smooth yeah. out some of that air sure. thread. So instead of me doing, I call it a liquid facelift, instead of me putting like four or five syringes in someone's face, they may need one or two because the threads did most of the work. Yeah. Cool. Exciting. So obviously you've admitted you've already had some fillers and some um, threads oh, yourself. Yeah. So for women who are our age, right? It yeah. sounds like doing some of these things maybe could prevent need for a significant yeah. facelift later in oh, life. What are your best, sure. what's your best advice to women our age as far as what they could be yeah. doing? So, so without even getting into injectables, sunscreen, 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 you know, the sun hitting your skin is the biggest thing that's going to do to age it. So that's number one, a good retinol at night. So retinol is like anti-aging secret right there. So retinol is great for skin at bedtime. If you have sensitive skin, you may want to do it every other night, but if you've got, you know, uh, you know, your skin's, you know, been around and seen some things like mine has, you can do retinol every night. Vitamin C in the morning is also really, really, really good. Really, really good. Okay. So those are like your non-injectable stuff. So sure. SPF, vitamin C, retinol at night, right? 
Um, some other things are things like microneedling. So microneedling, we call it collagen induction therapy. So what we're doing is we numb the face and, and who made it popular was um, Kardash Kim Kardashian. You know, it was like that blood vampire facial look, right? So what we do is, is we have a little pen and we've got five little 33 gauge needles on the end of it. And we do a microneedling procedure. So it's collagen induction therapy. So we're creating little micro traumas to the face and your body should stimulate its healing processes, which should tighten up pores, find lines, wrinkles, hyperpigmentation. So I say this is kind of like when we think about a pyramid, you know, that's kind of like at the bottom is good skincare routine, you know, maybe some microneedling because it's, it's again, very, very um, minimal compared to some of the other stuff. Um, and it does a good job of fine lines, wrinkles and things like that. Um, you know, dermaplaning. So dermaplaning is like almost like a manual exfoliation in that you're getting that little top layer of, of dead skin off and you're getting some of the peach fuzz off too, which when you get pellets, we tend to have a lot of, okay. So dermaplane is always, you know, a good one just to kind of keep the canvas clean. That's the goal here is keep the canvas clean. So, um, so there's that. And then I would say from, from our, from our age, I would say, you know, most women, I start to see injectables right around 30 and, you know, it's just a little bit, maybe just a little bit in their 11s and just like a little touch in their frontalis muscle. And they may not even get the full 30 units. It's, you know, it's like, I just need a little bit, uh, but I'll be honest with you. What happens is you start and then you're like, oh, dang, I just really like how that look. Go ahead and add a little bit more, add a little bit more, you know, kind of thing, um, which is fine, you know? Um, so Botox is a good way to start, you know, just minimal just to kind of keep things preserved. So the line doesn't get etched in or static, um, good, good skincare facials, you know, and as far as fillers, um, I think that's a, I think it's a preference. It just depends on your anatomy. So I am hundred percent honest with you. Uh, I've been getting injectables for the, since I've been injecting. So it's like the past four years, as far as how many syringes of filler I have in my face, uh, if I had to guess maybe about seven or eight, um, just because I, you know, certain areas of my face, like my under eyes and my, my, I have a very round face and I want it to be more, uh, contoured. And so I have, you know, quite a bit in my jawline. I have some in my chin. I have my under eyes done. I have my, I've done a couple my cheeks a couple times. Um, I've had my nasal labial folds done. Um, and then with the threads, what I like about it is I don't really need to do that much filler often because the threads are kind of doing the job for me. Sure. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I think definitely starting off with some injectables um, from like a neurotoxin is a good place to start, but really I think finding an injector who's going to be a hundred percent honest with you and is mm -hmm. not going to overdo it or upsell it. And I always say, look, if, if their face looks crazy, you're about to look crazy too. So <laughs> pick an injector, you know, you jive with, you know, they've explained things to the, you know, that you, if something were to happen, could you call them and, and they would handle it? You know what I mean? So um, I, I definitely think having a good relationship with your injector injector and, and, um, have making sure that they are very honest with you. Setting realistic expectations is, is key. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, we've covered some aesthetics here. I do want to talk about peptides. <laughs> oh yeah. Gosh. I, I feel like that could be a, a whole show on itself. So, <laughs> yeah. so, um, I know you had, you wanted me to kind of speak on the uh, weight loss peptides is yeah. kind of one of the, the big ones. So, so in my practice, we do a lot with health, wellness, weight loss, um, I, again, my background, you know, I used to run a medical weight loss program for a bariatrician. So I'm very familiar with a lot of the drugs on the market. Um, what I like about peptides is there are very little side effects from it. The safety profile compared to any of the stuff on the market is like outstanding. Uh, so what is a peptide? So a peptide is an amino acid, right? So if we think about uh, collagen, you know, like collagen powder that we take for our gut and our skin, that's a peptide uh, insulin. That's a peptide, right? So peptides are little branches of amino acids and then they're connected in different ways and they, they do different things on the body. So the most common peptide that I like to use for weight loss. And I caught, I, I like this one the most because it hits on so many different areas is one called CJC 1295 plus ipamorelin. And this is a growth hormone releasing peptide. So it actually on the pituitary gland to help your body increase its natural production of growth hormone. So instead of me giving you HGH is like me giving your body cake. I'm giving your body the batter to make its own cake. That's how I describe mm, peptides, right? I like that. Yeah. So the ipamorelin part is a growth hormone releasing peptide. So it allows that nice growth hormone that's secreted from the pituitary gland to, to get out to the cells to circulate. I like ipamorelin in comparison to semorelin because the half-life is longer. Okay. So that's why I like Ipamorlin. Um, what it does is it helps by increasing, um, fat metabolism. It helps with, uh, bone density. It helps with muscle mass. It helps with, um, anti-aging. It helps with sleep recovery, repair, um, immunity. 
Um, it's so crazy. A lot of my, I've been doing peptides for, I think going in my third year, but, um, I noticed that my patients who did not get COVID or my patients who I, I didn't have very many patients, honestly, thank God who did, who got COVID, but a lot of my patients who, who didn't get most of my patients who were on peptides, you know, didn't, we're fine. We're fine. And so I think that's really, really interesting. Yeah, um, yeah. So the immunity aspect of it too. Um, so how this works is it's, it's in a sequence. So week one to, I know people are like, okay, Lexi, I'm gonna take it. When am I going to get skinny? And I'm like, well, you got to meet with our health coach to make sure your <laughs> diet's right. And we got an exercise routine going on. Cause I, I always tell patients, you just taking these peptides is not going to make the, this is like the cherry on top of a Sunday. Like you got to do the work, but this yeah. is like the finishing touches to make your efforts yeah. go a long way. So week one, you typically notice your sleep gets better. Week two, focus and cognition tends to get better. Week three, um, skin texture tends to get better. So that creepiness in the, in the neck. Week four, recovery and repair tends to get better. And then week six and above is typically more of those body composition changes. So in my practice, we have something called an in-body 570. And so this yeah. does a, a good uh, body composition analysis because I don't really look at BMI. And I look at body fat percentage. I look at visceral fat. Fat, I look at basal metabolic rate. I look at all kinds of body fat mass, all those things. And so this is a great barometer of checking. Are we making the good changes we want to check? Because muscle can sometimes, um, take up space in the body where, you know, in relationship to gravity, you're still the same weight, but you've dropped 7% body fat. It's because of the peptides. So that's a really good peptide. That one's typically injected five days per week. We typically skip two days per week. Most of my patients skip Saturday and Sunday. Um, typically you're going to want to inject it before bed. If we're doing it for weight loss though, I typically recommend a dosing of five units, three times a day. Um, just because it, it, tends to accelerate the weight loss a little bit side effects with this one. Um, I typically see a little bit of a flush. Like you may get a little bit of a hot, fla hot flash for like a couple minutes and then it's over very, very quickly. Peptides have to be refrigerated. Um, and, uh, so that's kind of how those work. Uh, the next weight loss peptide I use what, is, can I go yeah, back go a second? So if patients are seeing body composition changes around six weeks, right? When are you doing that in body? Are you waiting 90 days? Like after the oh, first no, no, 90 no. days? Or yes. Right. So if you're a patient of mine, I let you do in bodies whenever you want. So some patients will do them every four weeks. Some patients are like, I'm going to come to an in body when I'm due for my refill of the bottle. And then we can kind of see, okay, is that working? Is that because I there's like three or four peptides I use for weight loss. So I'm like, maybe this one would be a better option for you. So I typically have them do it like about week six or week eight, right? Right. Because our bottles, the bottles, if you're dosing it twice a day, will last them about 10 weeks. So about week eight, and then we can kind of determine, do we want to continue or not? And they'll, they'll usually do that in body with like our health coach sure. and she'll kind of say, all right, you know, and she, our health coach is very well versed in peptides as well, just because we do a ton of them. So, so, um, uh, Stacy's awesome with that. So she'll kind of let me know like, Hey, I think this is going well, or she, she'll say, have you thought about this? Um, so sure. she'll even bring up some information to me. That's good. Um, so that's, that's kind of how that peptide works. Any questions on that? Uh, no, I mean, I, I think for listeners, so there are different, I don't even know what we call them. They all sound the same there. So there's Tessamorelin, Ipamorelin, um, even Sermorelin. Is that right? I don't know. There, there's just Simorelin. a lot of Yes, so I can never pronounce it. Similar they all sound the same. Okay. So yeah. these are all very similar that they're all going to help your body produce more of that growth hormone that you were alluding to. So different providers use maybe they have a different choice drug or they get a different one from different pharmacy, but they're all basically the same same thing other than you like the ipamorelin because of the longer half-life, it sounds like. <laughs> right, right, yeah. <laughs> All right. So yeah. So what else is in your toolbox yeah. here for so, weight loss? <laughs> uh, AOD. AOD stands for anti-obesity drug. And what this one specifically does, it works on uh, lipolysis. So it helps specifically with the breakdown of fat tissue. Um, that's what the lipolysis or lipolysis is, right? Breakdown of fat. So if you're trying to lose weight, that's what you're going for, right? Mm -hmm. Fat loss. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so with this one, um, it also has actually a nice positive effect on lipid levels. Um, so it can actually reduce cholesterol. Um, I know Dr. Seeds likes to use it for joint. He, he finds that it actually helps with joints. And I think he even injects AOD right into a joint. I like to, um, I've kind of messed with the protocol a little bit. And I've, like I, like I was telling you when we we're kind of off air is that, um, I have a really great relationship with a compound peptide pharmacist who's A4M trained and, and what's so neat is I always bounce ideas off her. I'm like, Hey, I'm going to change this protocol and I'll let you know what happens. And then, you know, she kind of works with me, which is so neat, but, um, so AOD works specifically on lipolysis helps break down fat tissue, um, also helps with joints. So if I have someone with a lot of visceral fat, I like to use this one now, not to be confused with Tessa Morlin, Tessa Morlin is on the market as Agrifta. Okay. So it's FDA approved Agrifta 
um, which sp specifically works on visceral fat. So it's a little different. It works on your body's ability to not store fat and help you break down the current fat situation. So it's different. Um, so I like that one. I typically cycle that one. Um, I usually do 20 units twice a day, maybe every three months kind of thing, um, just to kind of give them a little bit of a break. Um, and that's just personally what I do, what I have found best, um, just because I think that works really well for patients. So is that, so this AOD, because I haven't used this one. So is that, um, is that injected directly into where they have excess fat? Or does it matter? No, just any no, subcutaneous? no, it doesn't matter. It's a systemic, okay. yeah, it's a systemic absorption. Yeah. So it's subcutaneous okay. usually in the belly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What you're talking about though, that is, that's a deoxycholic acid. That is a fat dissolver, uh, which that, that goes back into the aesthetic stuff, but, but yes, yeah, so that is a little different. It's systemic absorption. Um, and then the other weight loss one that I like to use is melanotan two. So melanotan two is another peptide. It acts on the melanocortin receptors. I call this is like my Adapex, uh, my Adapex peptide in that it really controls cravings and appetite. You're just really not that hungry on it. We also call it the Barbie peptide in that it increases your, um, it increases your libido. It makes your skin more tan. One side effect though, is it can give you a really bad, like flush, like worse than the CJC, almost like you look like a sunburn for, you know, a couple minutes and then it's over. It's really quick freckling. So, um, uh, people will kind of get some weird freckles he here and there. The only contraindication to this peptide is a history of melanoma. We don't do it in melanoma patients. Um, right. AOD, I don't think has any contraindications except maybe pregnancy and breastfeeding. And then CJC, um, contraindications is active cancer. Sure. So sure. don't do it in there, but, um, so melanotan too, um, helps with, uh, we actually treat it also for mold. Um, so, which I don't get into mold, but I have a patient who sees another provider for yeah. mold. And I was like, maybe we do this peptide just for that. Um, yeah. so it I works see great. Lots also of mold. I mean, I see mold? lots of mold okay. and I know, and that's one of the reasons I also was interested in getting into peptides. So, mm -hmm. but yes, but we won't digress. Yeah. We'll stay on topic today. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, also really great for autoimmunity, really, really good for autoimmunity. So my TPO antibodies tend to drop when they're on this, um, which is so neat. So, so neat. Um, so this one's injection, injection, um, subcutaneous in the belly, 15 units daily for one to two weeks. Um, and then you change the protocol to 25 units twice weekly, or what I have found in my patients is they like to do 10 units five days a week because it helps control their appetite a little bit better. Sure. Um, again, freckling can be the biggest annoyance with this thing. When you stop it, the freckling, the freckling Freckling does go away, but, but some patients, it can get really, really bad. Like I had a lady who already had freckles and she's like, I think I just turned into a giant freckle. Oh, yeah, no. Kind of look like it. Um, so is that so, reversible so kinda, as it wears off then? Yes. I mean, it's not, yeah, yes. Yeah. Completely reversible. Yeah. So, uh, when I got my, my, my eyebrows microblading, ma microbladed, I stopped it and, um, and it, my skin lightened up and it was fine. Yeah. So what, it's great. It's great. I like it. How are these cycled then? So would someone take melanotan forever or how would they cycle it? No, no. So that's a good question. We, we get that a lot. The unfortunate thing, Stephanie, I mean, there is a lot of research to support peptides and their, you know, safety and effic efficaciousness. Um, however, there it's, they've not been around very long in the sense that not a lot of people are experimenting with them and to know what is exactly is best practice. And so kind of like what I said before, you know, I went through three or four certifications in, in peptide therapy through AMG, through A4M, yeah. through BioT. And I'm now at the level, I'm like, okay, I'm done with like intro certification courses. Now I'm ready to like do some continuing education. So mm -hmm. like I said, this summer, I'm going to go to uh, Dr. Seeds' SSRP. So those are going to be part of the questions is like, okay, what is best practice for protocol? So yeah, typically yeah. I have patients do three or four months, then take four to six weeks off and then, and then sure. restart it, then restart it. Mm -hmm. Because the thing you want to keep in mind is, is, you know, IGF one. Um, and, and it's kind of debatable. Do you check it? Do you not check it? You know, what do we, what's the optimal level again, kind of like women's testosterone. We don't really know what optimal level is it's like, whatever you feel good at that's optimal, you know? And so it's kind of one of those things that, eh, you know, do we check it or not check it? And so what, from what I've, from what I've, um, gathered is cycling the peptides is smart three to four months taking four Take to break, six weeks yeah. off and then rest yeah, restarting them yeah and, and so for the listeners um, so IG, igf1 is insulin like growth factor right so do we growth want if, if some of these peptides are going to impact growth hormone so basically growth hormone so do we want to check that do we want that to we don't know how high is too high right especially if you have cancer that's a bad thing you don't want growth hormone to be really high so that's why like you mentioned before some of the contraindications are active cancers for sure. Okay. Yeah, what are your other sure. favorite peptides? So we talked about peptides for weight loss. Oh. We go uh, no, or not? Should we go there for 
I can split this into two episodes. I, mean, yeah. so into two episodes. I was like, how, how many time, how much time you got? <laughs> um, so, so I honestly, I used to love thymus and alpha one TA one was one of yes. my by far favorite peptides. I use it a ton for autoimmunity, Me too. celiac, yep. uh, you know, I can't get it anymore. FDA took it away because of people. So that's the thing with providers and doing peptides. Yeah. When I discuss it with a patient, I say, has the potential to increase immunity or improve immunity? I don't, I would never say this treats COVID. That's stupid. I would never say it. Right. So because of that in the media or physicians making claims, now whether they did it and I don't know, but the FDA does not like that. And mm-hmm. so then they, they take stuff away from us, unfortunately. So TA1, by far one of my favorite peptides. I was on that for quite some time during the pandemic mm-hmm. as, as a preventative. Um, so mm-hmm. I like that for autoimmunity. It helps the thymus gland um, increase the immune protection. I like uh, BPC-157, which is body protection compound. I actually use this a ton in my uh, gut patients, leaky gut, yep. uh, SIBO, colite. I have lymphocytic and collagenous colitis patients. Uh, body protection compound helps with recovery, restoration, repair. So the three R's, um, it's a capsule, uh, really cost effective. And I usually have them do it for about two months, maybe take four weeks off and then do it again. So it works really, really well. Um, I also like, um, GHKCU, which is my anti-age. So if you're going to ask me, okay, what, what would you do for anti-aging? I say GHKCU is a really neat, neat peptide. So we actually do it in serum. I do it in a cream. So for face, and then I do it for an injection. Um, studies actually show that it'll decrease by wrinkles by about 30% by about six weeks. So that's a really, really like, that's like, that's high quality stuff. If you can avoid like a, a, a toxin, like, you know, if people have got yeah, issues with yeah. Botox, like yeah. that's a great option. Um, so that's a really good one. PT 141. That's probably another one I use a lot of. So again, I'm going to stop you. I'm going to stop you for a second before we go to libido. So let me go back for a second. So, copper, so basically those are what you just mentioned because the listeners may not know what that is. Basically copper peptides, right? That can be applied topically. Yeah the skin and we carry those at the clinic and those have been hot sellers <laughs> for sure. Um, there are, well, I was also going to say on the aesthetic topic before we go to libido, do you use peptides for hair loss? Do you use topical serums also? Oh, oh absolutely. Yeah. Yep. So I actually do, I do PRP treatments in the hair. So I do yeah. PRP. I will do GHKCU in the morning, but really I feel like the, 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 uh, winner is the PTDM with valporic acid. I yep. use that as a spray at night yep. and it works phenomenal. So what I say is when I w- works phenomenal, what I would see after one treatment of PRP with those peptides is what I would almost see after three treatments of just PRP. So it's, it's some higher level stuff in that it, it accelerates those results. And what it does is it strengthens the hair follicle and the, sure. and the size of the follicle. So it works extremely well. Um, oh, however, uh, this year we'll be bringing on exosomes. So exosomes is, yeah. is the most purest biologic. You're going to get more than PRP. Cause if you think about it, let's say you have a man in his fifties and he's losing his hair and you're like, okay, let's PRP it. And his diet is just absolute, not good you know, the PRP reflects him. So like your best patients are going to be your healthy patients yep. who eat, drink water, eat good, do not a lot of impurities in their PRP. Cause then their PRP is going to be tainted if they don't have a good, a and again, good, for uh, the listeners, I just got to break this down. PRP is platelet, platelet rich plasma. Platelet so basically, rich plasma. Yeah. so you basically have in your blood taken and then spun down and then the plasma injected, right. Which is full of peptides, right. Injected yeah. back into your scalp. And that's something I exactly. on my to-do list this year. I want to be able to offer PRP also. We offer the topical, all the topicals you mentioned, but I want to be able to do PRP as well. Um, because oh, yes, yeah. we can work on our face, but for many women, it's it's not even the face, it's the hair, <laughs> the loss of hair that's really impacting their confidence and whatnot. So um, you for offer, sure. it sounds like everything in your practice, which is awesome. Okay, let's go on <laughs> then to, you are about to talk about, I think, PT-141. Libido? Yes. Yeah. So PT-141 is a derivative of melanotan. So bromeotide is is, um, kind of the derivative of it. And so PT-141 is what we call it. This is a peptide that acts as an aphrodisiac. Um, So we use it in men and women. Um, It can come in an injection. It can come in a trochee, which is a dissolvable like little melt away. It's like a, it feels like a crayon, but it's a dissolvable melt away. Do you think that works um, as well as the injection or no? I've only offered injections. I'll tell you why. Yeah. Yeah, because the gastric acid, well, it's really, you should be absorbing it subbucally because it's a trochee, right? The nausea though, the side effect of nausea. So I actually had Linda, my compound pharmacy, um, 
mix it with B6 to help with the, as an anti-emetic. That's smart. Um, it helped a little bit, but I feel like the injection and the nasal spray are, are far superior just because the injection gets in there real quick. So yeah. um, studies actually show that men who did not respond to Viagra or Cialis are 80% more likely to respond to PT-141. So Which is crazy. I feel like in- yeah, this has oh, a totally absolutely. different mechanism of action. It works on the nervous system, right? Calm you down. Right, right. So if you think about Cialis and Viagra, those are vasodilators. So what they do is they increase blood flow to the genital area to help with things like arousal or maintaining of erection. What this does, it acts more on the brain. So it helps up there, which sometimes is the problem, unfortunately. Um, so, so it works extremely, extremely well. So I, I, I offer it nasal spray and I offer it an injection. Mm -hmm. Sure. Anything else for libido? Do you do like oxytocin or screen cream or anything? Yeah. Any yeah. So we have something called, yeah, we have something called the goddess protocol. So we, do, of course we do. Uh, so we have oxytocin nasal spray. We've got uh, uh, sildenafil, DHEA, aminophilin um, for topicals. And then we do, so in my goddess protocol, there's PT-141 in it as well. So that topical combination you were referring to, so that would be applied vaginally before intercourse, right? Yes. Help yeah. So you, sensation yeah. And, yep. Right. You apply it to like the clitoral region. So the, the Viagra in the topical will increase the blood flow to the tip of the clitoris. The oxytocin is the love hormone. So this is typically peaked either after you have a baby, when you're breastfeeding, um, after you have an orgasm, or it just, what it does is it promotes a closeness or a bond, you know, yeah, connection to, hormone. Yeah. So, yeah. So the connection is there. You're just more into it. Um, yeah. And then yeah, you're kind of, you're kind of hitting all the, all the aspects of barriers of why maybe women struggle with libido, which is a common problem. My goodness. Um, I almost think it's rare when I say it to a woman, like any issues with your bleed and they're saying, no, I'm like, I'll fall out my chair. I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> great. That's awesome. I feel like more times than not, that's what brings them to my practice. And they're like, I need your help. I'm like, okay. I totally agree. What about a I know we have heard, well, at least I have had some other guys talk a little bit about that. Do you use that in your yeah. practice? Yeah. So we just, we just kind of started using that one a little bit more mainly because it's now available through my compound pharmacy that I use locally. Um, what it does is it, it lengthens the telomeres. Um, and so from a longevity perspective, as we age or as we're exposed to just toxins and bad stuff, it, it shortens our telomeres, which ages us quicker. So this is like the fountain of youth peptide, so to speak. And so, yeah. um, that, that's kind of what I know about it. Now, the question is, do you actually feel anything when you take it? No, I don't, I don't think you'll notice yeah. anything. I think yeah. you will notice nothing from it. So yeah. I, I, maybe I find that that's not the most popular because people are like, I want the, like people love when the flush happens after their CGC. I'm like, Ooh, I know it's working. working. And it's in there. Yeah. <laughs> With a pit on, they're like, eh, I don't really notice anything. I'm like, you're not going to, but I am looking into seeing how can I measure telomeres in patients? Cause yeah. I, I, you know, I, I love me a good before and after. So I'm going to try to yep. figure that out. I've got Linda helping me with that. My pharmacy, um, on how can I measure telomeres and then do like, you know, six weeks try, of this and yeah. measure it again and yeah. see what happens. Absolutely. Well, you've been a wealth of knowledge. This is super interesting. And basically now I yeah, just, yeah, didn't... absolutely. Now I have a high desire to incorporate all of this into my practice, but yeah, <laughs> but I have to do one I thing. Know. It's, time. it's hard. Yeah. Baby yeah. steps, baby steps. Absolutely. So let me ask I have two more questions for you. So one, is there anything that you didn't get a chance to share today? That is a huge passion of yours, something that you do use in your practice really from a longevity standpoint. Um, I mean, I, I, we do prolon. You know, I feel like yeah. Prolon needs yeah. to be mentioned. You know, that does. If you've read the book, The Longevity Diet by mm -hmm. Walter Longo, I, I feel yeah. like that is actually huge. Uh, I think yeah. that was your podcast last last it week. It was at lunch. Was kind of, yeah. I was like, I feel yeah. like I saw it. I read yeah. it or heard it. Um, yep, so I yep. do think Prolon is a great option. Now, you know, there's some controversial research as far as don't do, don't do that in your autoimmune patients. You're going to elicit a cortisol response. Oh, okay. It's only five days. It's not like right. you're doing it every day. Right. So I do think Prolon is a great addition to any integrative anti-aging mm -hmm. medicine practice. I think, you know, staying up to date on what's current, what's best practice, collaborating with like-minded individuals, I think is key, you yep. know, um, but no, I think it's the whole package. You know, I, I, I don't, I don't, it's, it's diet, it's gut health, it's nutrition, it's sleep, it's lifestyle. Yep. It's, there isn't you know, one all these answer. Cool peptides. Yeah. No, right. there, there really isn't. All these cool peptides are ways for me to just make, make, uh, make your quality of life better or, you know, trying to get the most out of life. That's really yeah. what the goal here is. Um, so I always say, we're just trying to disrupt aging, you know, aging, unfortunately, there's not really an a ICD 10 code for aging. It doesn't mean it sucks any less. And so, uh, you know, I just say, I just say, I would like to have my patients age, age gracefully age well, mm -hmm. 
you know, in the second half or, you know, my 50 year olds are like, man, I haven't felt this good ever. Others say I haven't had this best, best of sex ever. And I'm like, well, that's, I don't know if that's sad or if I should just hug you, but um, it's good. It's good. I yeah. love how you said peptides. So it's are a like full the- package. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love how you said that I had never heard this before that kind of peptides are kind of like the Jerry on, on top of the cake because I kind of mm-hmm. parallel to how I opened the, the, the episode, I think from a longevity standpoint, there are several steps, right? Before we even get to aesthetics or extras or, you know, peptides, whatnot, we have to improve gut health. We look at genetics. We do optimize hormones. That's huge with us. Um, we detox the body. We look at cardiovascular risk. We look at immune health. I mean, there's so many things we can do to better longevity in our patients, but there are fancy little cherry, cherry on top <laughs> of the cake options mm-hmm. that, that we as providers who stay progressive have in our toolbox. So I love that you have that. Uh, tell me what mm-hmm. your top longevity tip is and this could even be for you something that you incorporate daily weekly whatnot um i i definitely feel like try not to overstress so as you very well know owning a practice being a nurse practitioner so in the midwest it's really hard to be a nurse practitioner business owner it's it's really hard in that Uh i feel like we almost have to be overly um, conscious of getting, yep. getting a good informed consent, making sure all your documentation mm-hmm. is there just because unfortunately, and when we talk about standard of care and you can't see me air quoting it, listeners, but there's, there's standard of care. Standard of care is the bare minimum someone has to do to do a, uh, to manage someone. I feel like in integrative medicine, functional medicine, we go above and beyond the standard of care. And a lot Mm. of times it's ridiculed. So um, don't stress. I I guess so. I try not to stress, you know, and um, I always make sure that I I get some good quality sleep. I think to me, sleep is huge. Um, You know, working out as far as exercise, I, you know, at minimum five days a week. Um, and my preference is CrossFit just because I like lifting weights and I like how it makes me feel. I, I have a, a patient who's like a, a, a Reiki master and she's like, I think you should meditate. And I'm like, I'm an Enneagram seven. Like my mind goes at like a hundred miles a minute. I can't slow down. Like, so even though, you know, I do that, like, you know, I've, I've tried Yo- to just- yoga once a week would be good for you. you yeah. Can do your CrossFit, but you also need a little yoga. Yes. In there. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I try not to overly stress. I think that's huge. Cause I think when someone walks in stress, it looks like stress on them. Like you yeah. look aged. Yep. Um, I think staying consistent with a good skincare routine. So you can't treat your face, face like a flip-flop and expect it to look like a Louis Vuitton. Yeah. So I think good skincare, I think is key. Um, and then really finding balance with your diet, I think is probably the, the third biggest thing. And what I mean by that is, look, I'm a mom, I've got three kids. I have a set of twins that are 11 and a three-year-old. Like it's, you can't eat perfect all the time. So I definitely think making sure that you've got good balance and that don't overly stress about it. And I, th- I think honestly, like my, my dad always says, if Lexi was any more calm, she'd be sedated. Um, <laughs> and so I, I just try not to overly stress. I try to get a good exercise routine to balance out with sleep and nutrition, you know? So as you can see, none, none of it was peptides. I mean, yes, pellets are awesome. You know, I, I stay consistent with those just because of all the benefits you get. And I feel like they make, they make me get the most out of my workouts. Mm-hmm. Peptides are awesome, but I think it's the foundations. I think mm-hmm. it's the foundation. Love it. Love it. Love it. Okay. Lexi, tell us where listeners can find you and follow you. Yeah. So my practice is located in Indiana. Uh, we're located in a city called Noblesville, Indiana, which is in, um, a North suburb of, of the, uh, center, which is Indianapolis. Um, our address is one zero four zero zero pleasant street, uh, Noblesville, Indiana. Our website is www.udirecthealth.com. Our that's two, Instagram- that's Y O O. Yeah. Just yeah. Oh, like Y-O-O. Y-O-O. Yes. Y-O-O. My, yeah. My husband's Korean. So that's where that comes from. I'm not Korean. I'm, I'm actually Mexican. Um, the website is udirecthealth.com. Um, my Instagram handle is you direct health underscore aesthetics. And then my podcast is called the better you project. So I've actually done a couple podcasts about peptides and medical supervised weight loss and, and things like that. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of where, where I'm at. Well, you're a ball of fire. So <laughs> thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing oh, so absolutely. much with our listeners. I think I will hopefully be able to divide this into a couple episodes. So thanks <laughs> sure. again for sharing all your expertise and your big smile and, and help for our listeners. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.